I got to Manchuria at the end of March 1945 by student mobilization. By this time Japan had already lost Manila, the island of Eshuaijima, the American army was approaching Okinawa. Despite this, I, then a teenager, a fourth grade high school student, believed in Japan's ultimate victory. Several of my comrades left school and voluntarily enrolled, some in aviation, some in special officer schools. I, too, firmly decided to devote myself to the great cause of defense of the motherland and at the first opportunity to join the army. And one day my class teacher called me and asked me if I wanted to volunteer for the army. He did not give me any details, but only hinted that I would have to go to Manchuria to the Kwantung army. This coincided with my long-time dream of going to the mainland. I was influenced by the then fashionable war stories and adventurous novels about the adventures of the Japanese on the mainland. But most of all, I was influenced by the postcards sent by my brother who served on the smart. The views on these pictures were very similar to the beautiful pictures I had drawn in my imagination. And my brother's stories during his visits to the country fueled my boyish curiosity. Yes, I would like to go there, I answered. And the teacher immediately sent me home to get my parents' consent and told me to return to school in the evening with a final answer. My older brother was in the army, and I hadn't heard from him for a long time, so naturally my parents didn't want to let me go. My father didn't protest so much, though. I guess it can't be helped if you've decided to go, he said, but my mother tried to persuade me to stay. You're going to be drafted soon anyway, so why bother to volunteer? But I was determined to go and all the exhortations of my mother, who was worried about my fate, could not change my decision. If I had to go anyway, wouldn't it be better to do it sooner? That way you can get promoted faster, I told my parents. I insisted, so I hurried back to the school and told the teacher that my parents agreed. The teacher took me to the waiting room, where an army recruiter was waiting for us, touring high schools in the surrounding prefectures. The recruiter's name was Nakano. He was a junior army official and wore a badge with a white star on a dark green background and epaulettes with a single gold emblem. I looked at him with great envy, trying to imagine how I myself would look in the same splendid uniform. Hmm. Teacher told me about your success in your studies, Nakano said to me affectionately. We need young people like you. The mobilization of students that we are doing is tantamount to conscription, and you should be proud of that. Nakano asked me about my health, my family. But what I wanted to know most of all, my future duties, he did not say anything definite. He handed me 350 yen to prepare for my departure and warned me to wait for the summons and be ready to depart at any moment. At that time, 350 yen was a lot of money, and such a large sum involuntarily caused some anxiety even in my childish soul. I knew, for example, that the eldest son of our neighbors, who after graduating from high school, had joined the village government, received only 35 yen a month, while the monthly salary of an elementary school principal was something like a 100 yen. What would that mean? I wonder what I'll have to do. I asked myself, well, hi, Rochan, you'll probably have some very serious responsibilities. We'll pack you well for the journey. I've had a lot of help at home. No, true, you can't buy anything for any money now, complained my mother to the neighbors. It seemed that she was even upset that I was given so much money. Maybe she was frightened by the thought that the money would be counted later as compensation to the relatives of the deceased. In fact, for so-called traveling equipment could we talk about, when for money we could not get not only clothes or shoes, but even sweets. So I was notified of my departure by postcard four days later. My father, who usually did not spoil us with his attention, this time declared, Matite, I'm going to see you off. I left home in a coat with bamboo buttons wearing a coarse, dark green student uniform with a pattern reminiscent of mosquito netting, and my older brother's shoes. Standing at the gate, my mother looked at me for a long time. Together with my father, I came, as the postcard said, to the city hotel. Three teenagers were already there. One of them, Kusuno, was a fellow countryman, and the other two were from a neighboring prefecture. Only one Kusuno, a quiet-looking boy, was accompanied by his relatives, except for me. Feeling the same sadness of parting with their children, my father and Kuzuno's mother got to talking. My boy has never gone anywhere before, and I'm very worried about how he'll do there. Please, please don't hurt him. I beg you all, said Kuzuno's mother, a simple-looking woman, and even bowed to us. It's okay. My son hasn't been anywhere yet either. They'll be friends in no time. 
After all, they are fellow soldiers, her father reassured her. He proudly said the words fellow soldiers and laughed. Kasuno's mother began to tell him about her life. My husband died a long time ago, and I barely managed to put my youngest in middle school. But I decided that I couldn't stay away at a time like this, and my teacher advised me to do so. Her hair had already turned grey, and all three of us looked at the old woman curiously, listening to her words. Kusuno seemed to notice this and was embarrassed. You'll have a mum, he said shamefully and looked at her pleadingly. Soon we were alone. Nakano did not speak to us as he had the first time. There was a different tone in his voice. As of today, you are in the army. You must imbibe the new spirit and be strong and courageous. From the hotel, we went to Yonhara. There, eight other teenagers from different prefectures, along with their recruiter Takayama, were waiting for us on the platform. Just at that time, an air raid began, and we began to doubt whether we would be able to leave. But soon we were no longer in doubt. We were enlisted in the army by special order so we were put on the first train with the cadets. Arriving in Shimonoseki, we joined young men from Kyushu, Shikoku, Shugoku, and Kansai districts waiting for the steamer to Korea. In the Korean Strait, the enemy dominated the sea and air, and two whole days passed in vain waiting for the steamer. Then Nakano and another recruiter, Otsuno, hired a fishing boat, on which we crossed to Hokar in the dead of night. Everyone's spirits began to sink. We began to realize that we were surrounded by a mystery, and therefore avoided even friendly conversation. Although we were now bound by the same fate, there was no real intimacy between us. In the north of Kyushu, the cherry blossoms were in full bloom, but we, who were anxiously awaiting the ship, were not concerned about them. Finally, on the morning of March 31, two white steamers appeared on the horizon. There was no wharf at Hakata and in small groups we reached the ships in Dinghais and climbed up to the deck on the storm trap. However, we did not immediately put to sea and again waited for something. Everyone felt very cramped in the new environment from unaccustomedness. We were not allowed to open the portholes or go on deck, so we were cooped up until the next morning. We were bored and restless and hunger made itself felt. Each of us had only a small bowl of rice and salted seaweed boiled in soy. We were so hungry that we wanted to eat even in our sleep. I still had some rice cakes in my sack, which my mother had stolen, but of course I could not eat them alone, but shared them with those who were near, and above all with Kusuno. Give me one too. I'm really hungry, said a voice behind me. It was Hayashida who was watching us from the sidelines. There was no hint of humiliation in his tone. I liked his open nature. In the evening, as I headed for the washroom, he followed me and on the way said, your scone is very tasty. Then he shyly asked, No? Do you like sweets? Yes, very much, I answered, lingering a moment in the doorway. Well, when it gets dark, Hayashida said cryptically and walked away. In the evening, when I was already falling asleep, Hayashida quietly approached me and silently put a piece of grape sugar in my mouth. He laughed when I flinched in surprise, and his open smile warmed my heart. From that time we became friends. For two days the steamers were anchored and only on the third day about ten o'clock in the morning they set sail. The ships went quickly, apparently fearing the attack of enemy submarines, and in about five hours we arrived in Fusan. At Fusan we were put on a fast train bound for Xinjing. The final destination of our journey was still unknown. After travelling all over the Korean peninsula, we ended up in Xinjing. During the day we were taken to the Kwantung Army headquarters, Xinjin Temple and Kodama Park, and at night we were put on a train leaving for Harbin. Harbin, washed with fresh morning dew, seemed to me a fairy tale city. High crowns of trees, shrouded in a light, milky white veil, rose above the red tiled roofs, and from somewhere came ticking music. The chirping of birds could be heard. To leaving the train station, our group headed into town. Soon we stopped at the corner of Girinskaya Street. In front of us was a stone two story building with a Japanese style roof and some narrow entrance doors. This must be the place, my neighbors whispered, sleep deprived and tired. We all rejoiced. We had finally arrived at our destination. We were led into the courtyard of the building. An army official with a gold eyelet and one star on his epaulets congratulated everyone on their arrival and said, While the car arrives, I'll take you out to eat. How not to Ray looked at each other. We all had the same thought. How not here yet? It turned out that it was only a communication point with our unit. 
In a cellar the owner of which was a Russian, we ate a lot of care rays. It was the first time since we had left home that we had been fed to our heart's content. Hayashida, who had an older brother in the army, knew all the ranks and rights of the freelancers. He explained to us that the man who had escorted us to the mess hall was a junior official with a rank equivalent to that of a field officer. When we returned to the courtyard, we were given overcoats, boots, pistols and sabres. Well, now you have become employees of Manchurian Detachment, 731, the chief of the communications station encouraged us. In the north of Manchuria, it is cold in the spring, and we had enough time to get cold. So we immediately changed into overcoats, pulled on warm boots and on our faces, which were blue from the cold, blushed again, looking at their reflection in the glass doors. The young soldiers, between whom friendship had begun to develop, clapped each other cheerfully on the shoulder. A military truck, covered with a tarpaulin, did not come for us until the second hour of the afternoon. We were silently put into the truck, and it started. We could not even determine the direction of travel. Through the small round glass windows in the tarpaulin I could see fields and monuments to the fallen in the battles. The truck was rushing with terrible speed along the deserted, deserted road. After about an hour the truck slowed down sharply and, having made a few sharp turns, stopped. Hmm. Here we are, said Nakano, who had accompanied us. I jumped down to the ground, drenched in the spring sunlight, and, like a man barely awake from a dream, squinted in the dazzling sunlight, trying to make sense of the scene before me. No, it was not a play of imagination caused by the dazzling glow of the sun. In the very center of the flat, monotonous plains stood tall, modern buildings which I had not expected. In the center, a huge quadrangular, white-tiled building towered above all the other structures. I had not seen such large buildings in Osaka, Sinjing, or Harbin, which we had passed through on our way here. Illuminated by the rays of the sun, it seemed dazzling white and soared high, obscuring the sky. The building was surrounded by a brick wall, with several rows of barbed wire stretched across it. When I looked back, I saw that a little farther behind us, there was a high earth rampart with barbed wire, and I realized that the whole town was isolated from the outside world. This rampart, as I later learned, stretched for five kilometers, and the central building was three times the size of the Maruburu building in Tokyo. We stood on the plats in front of the barracks and training buildings. Mr. Chief of Training will be speaking to you now. Stand up, Mr. Kamiya, who greeted us, commanded us. Handing us over to another freelancer, Asumi, he ran to meet the head of the training department. Judging by the fierce look on Kamiya's face, he was an angry and snooty man. We felt uncomfortable being commanded by a man who was only a junior military official, not to mention Nakano in front of whom we also had to behave according to his rank. Everyone's place in the formation hadn't been determined yet, so after the formation, I, Hayashida, and Kusuno were next to each other. Mm, so scary, someone whispered quietly with a sigh. Everyone's attention was fixed on the huge imposing buildings, and nothing could be seen behind them. We didn't know where we were yet, but we felt that we were in a special purpose unit. To the east of the building in the center rose a huge chimney. Black smoke billowed from it. In the distance beyond the chimney could be seen the airfield. To the west of the building lined a row of white houses that looked like hospital buildings, warehouses, and European-style housing. Smiling, Nakano smugly said, They say that the chimney of that boiler room over there is the second largest in Manchuria. Well. I guess this is the first time you've ever seen such a big chimney. But we were not so much amazed as concerned. Like everyone else, I was depressed by the sight of the wire fences and seized by a vague feeling of some fear. There was no trace of the carefree mood with which I had travelled to Manchuria, and for the first time I thought seriously about what awaited me here. The head of the training department was Lieutenant Colonel Nishi of the Medical Service. When he ascended to the dais, I thought that now we would hear about our service. But Nishi gave us only the usual greeting, congratulated us on our safe arrival and, wishing us good health, urged us to give our best to the upcoming service. In the evening at dinner we were fed to the full with pork, sweet pie, and other delicious dishes of which we in Japan could only dream. We were fed just as hearty and delicious afterward. The next day we and another hundred people who arrived here at different times were gathered together and divided into study groups. Almost all of us were the same age, the only difference being that some of us had completed four grades of high school, others had completed a full high school, 
and some had only completed elementary school. Hayashida and I wanted to be in the same group, so we got in line next to each other, but we were separated. I was in the fourth group and Hayashida was in the third. Each group had 17 to 18 men. Our group was led by Osumi, a freelancer from Shimonoseki, and we breathed a sigh of relief. In Hayashida's group, the chief was Komigya, who had made such a repulsive impression on us yesterday. The barracks where we were to live were small one-story barracks. In the middle of each barracks was an aisle, on either side of which, at some distance from the floor, were solid bunks with shrouded bedding, and the barracks were heated by stoves, and the windows were double-framed. Below the windows along the wall were small, individual shelves for personal belongings. Life in the detachment was regulated by the usual rules for each military unit, but materially we were provided incomparably better than it was in any other unit. So in Japan we had to eat everything down to grass and bran, but here we were fed with selected food in the morning and evening, and only at lunchtime sometimes soy beans were added, and on special days established by order for the whole army. We were given boiled goat and other days, in addition to rice, our daily ration included pork of all kinds. We could freely buy seiki and various sweets at a shop in the unit. My monthly salary was incredibly high. In addition to the basic salary of about a hundred yen, I received front pay and an allowance for service in a dangerous area. The total was about three hundred yen, which I couldn't spend if I wanted to, and there was nowhere to spend all but thirty yen for pocket money was deposited in a military savings book each month. Up to 100 yen a month was allowed to be sent to my parents. I wrote to my mother about it. When giving my return address, I wrote Manchukuo, Binjiang Province, Pingfan District before the words 731st Manchurian Detachment, Training Department. I was admonished that one should never state the location of a unit and write about what is done here, and was ordered to rewrite the letter. I had to rewrite the postcard. I knew that it would be read by the censors and therefore I did not write about our unit. However, even this postcard, if it had fallen to the chief of the group, would probably have seemed imprudent to him. Although in only two or three lines I told only that I was alive and well and asked whether it was necessary to send money, writing about my impressions, about the towns we had passed through on our way here, about my comrades here, was obviously not allowed either. A reply came from my mother. She wrote that I should not worry as everything was well at home, and that I should give my savings to my motherland. What a wonderful mother you have, and you be strong, don't give in. Asumi's team leader handed me a postcard from my mother. It was a month after I arrived at the site. I did not yet know why we had to keep the secret of our stay here so strictly, but soon everything became clear, and I was more and more often and sharply tormented by remorse, why I came to this terrible place. Soon the classes began. Until noon we had military training, and then lectures on various subjects, but the study of them was put unusually. Besides general subjects, we listened to lectures on various infectious diseases. Typhus, dysentery, cholera, diphtheria, tuberculosis, saper, plague, and many others. Our teachers were military and freelance doctors. All of them had high ranks and academic degrees of doctors of medical sciences. Many of us did not have the slightest idea about contagious diseases and had only one aversion to them, so we felt somewhat depressed at the lectures. We were very surprised to learn that the Japanese army had a special medical unit like ours. But very soon we began to understand in general terms its character and purse. But we had not the slightest idea of the kind of work for which we were being trained, nor did we even think to critically understand the meaning of our training. It was as if we, unsophisticated teenagers, born and raised in remote villages, had been gathered here, far away from people, to be prepared for secret service. There were rumours that after two or three years of training here, we would be sent to the medical institute in Harbin, and, when we reached the age of conscription, would be left in the unit as laboratory assistants. We were destined to spend our entire lives in the detachment. Despite this, we diligently studied all the subjects we were taught. After all, we had to pass exams. Oh. Put out of your mind the thought that some day you will return home. And these words of the chiefs did not compare to a banal expression in the army, such as, Don't think that you will be able to return home alive. There was a clear concern for secrecy. Apart from us, a total of about a hundred men who had recently arrived here, most of the squad lived with their families in government apartments in three story European style buildings in the western part of the camp. About half of them, 
About 2,000 people were military and freelance doctors and other specialists who knew only an apartment and a workplace in the laboratory. In the location of the detachment were large research laboratories, which of course are not necessary for an ordinary military unit. There were also power stations, various warehouses, kennels for experimental animals, a shop, a sports ground, a small park, a lecture hall with movie equipment, vegetable gardens, an airfield and even a swimming pool and a temple. Supply the detachment with everything necessary, and communication was carried out through the military medical school. Located in the small town of Exingiaolan, there was a railroad line from the Pingfan railway station to the detachment location, and a special purpose highway belonging to the detachment connected the detachment with Harbin. Probably few people, even those who lived in Manchuria, knew that just 20 kilometers south of Harbin and 8 and a bit kilometers west of Pingfan station, there was a special detachment with such a diverse economy. The area where the detachment was located was declared a restricted zone. No one could stop closer than 10 kilometers from the camp without a special pass, which could only be issued by the Kuei Tung Army headquarters. Only occasional passengers, who occasionally passed through Pingfan, admired from afar the majestic panorama that floated like a mirage in the streams of sun heated air. On the eastern and western outskirts of the town, in addition to the air ambulance assigned to the detachment for the transportation of patients, there were also air detachments for the direct protection of the camp from the air. All other airplanes were strictly forbidden to fly over the territory of the detachment. Any violator was threatened with a court-martial. The gates on the territory of the camp were, of course, strictly guarded, especially carefully guarded brick-walled laboratories in the centre of the town. No one could pass through there, not even those of the squad, except those who worked in them. A guard of twenty military gendarmes, headed by a lieutenant or sub-lieutenant, was constantly posted at the only entrance to this holy of holies of the squad. The guards were so vigilant that it seemed unlikely that an ant would have crawled through the gate unnoticed. At the gate was conspicuous a shield about three square meters in size, on which in ink in Japanese and Chinese was written. Announcement? So, um, entry without the permission of the commander of the Kwantung army is forbidden to all without exception. Violators will be court-martialed and severely punished. No excuses will be accepted. 2. Persons working here are required to present a pass. Commander of the Kwantung Army. Of the severity of the guards I had occasion to see for myself. It happened a few days after our arrival at the detachment. Fulfilling an assignment from the training department, my fellow officer Morishima and I, along with two freelancers, got into a truck and left the location of the camp. As we drove away from the town, the freelancers suddenly stopped the truck after talking to each other. You must return to the detachment, they said. Since Harbin was ahead, where we could have fun, we were a little upset, but there was nothing to do, and we had to get off the truck. Turning to the camp, we mistook the gate for another one, mistaking it for the one we had just left through. We immediately realized our mistake by the way the soldiers guarding the gate looked us over from head to toe. There are two of us. Perhaps we can confine ourselves to a general salute, I said to Morishima. Perhaps we can. Go ahead in command, he replied. Seeing that Morishima himself was firmly unsure how to proceed, I gave the command. Harder step. And, with a tight step, we headed for the gate. The guards stood on both sides of the gate, and I could not determine which of them should be greeted. Besides, none of them had insignia, and it was impossible to establish who was senior in rank. There was no time to think, and I decided to salute the larger group and gave the command. Eyes left. But immediately I heard the command. Stop. I intuitively felt that I had greeted wrongly, but I did not know what to do, and, freezing with fear, stood at attention. Last name? What unit? We breathed a sigh of relief and, taking out our eyed cards, answered. The one who stopped us, flipping through our EDs, asked us the names of our senior commanders, date of birth, and finally ordered us to strip down to our waists. We had no choice but to comply with the order. Worried, we began to undress. Probably such a thorough check of persons who were not yet well known to the guards was a common practice here. Even the most insignificant peculiarities had to be entered on the identity card. Therefore, an attempt by anyone who, having stolen the identity card, would want to penetrate into the location of the detachment, would end in failure. It seemed to us teenagers that, from the point of view of common sense, 
It was enough to compare photos, but common sense was the last thing on the guards' minds. However, it seemed senseless only at first glance, and in fact it was justified by the interests of security. Just a mystery of the squad. We did not yet know what it consisted in, but we already felt the necessity of strictly preserving it. Not four weeks after the beginning of the study of the basics of bacteriology and other subjects, we were given an examination to determine everyone's abilities for practical work in the laboratories hidden behind strong brick walls, and in other buildings where the strictest secrecy was required, only those who, after the examination, had been assigned to a department were allowed to enter. If we had been brought here through such hardships and dangers, we must have been in great need of our hands. So of our study group of seventeen, only seven were selected. Chamaka from Tokyo was placed in the general division. I was enrolled in the first division. Kusuno Morijima from my white prefecture and Shirayama from Wakayama prefecture in the second division. Ishitsuka from Kumato prefecture and Kanei from Okayama prefecture in the third division. The other ten had to do agricultural work along with military and other training. The seven of us were forbidden to tell anyone or talk to each other about the content of the work. I was assigned to the first division, the plague section, where my immediate superior, laboratory technician Segawa, sternly warned, Look, don't tell anyone about your work, not even those who live with you. If you do, you'll be in trouble. All this was probably done so that no one in the squad, except the most senior officers, would know about the activities of the squad as a whole. We, our seven, having lived together, had become very friendly, and now, parting, we felt like new people from other groups had arrived, and we had to move to other rooms. I, Hamanaka, Morijima, and Kusuno were again in the same room, but we were together only in the mornings during inspection and sometimes at evening classes. We ate breakfast in the bachelor's dining room, and at half past eight we went to our workplaces. I had heard that Hayashida was also assigned to the department and left here, but it bothered me a great deal that I could not see him for some time. I was working in the building where the experimental animals were kept. This building was similar in shape and size to a school. There were horses, cows, sheep, pigs, chickens, and rabbits, but most of all there were mice, rats, and guinea pigs. I got to see it all with my own eyes once, and although the proverb says it's better to see once than to hear a hundred times, I couldn't imagine how many there were. How many of them are there? I asked Sagawa one day, and he, silently pointing his head, nevertheless answered. No, so many, you say? There are about a hundred thousand mice alone. Wherever I went, everywhere in the rooms, there was a disgusting smell of mice, reminiscent of decomposed urine. All the black work was done by the Manchus, of whom there were about forty men. They cut grass, prepared fodder, carried coal, and were not allowed to leave the rat squad. These unfortunates were condemned to live there until they died. Huge quantities of grain, millet and soybeans were used to feed the animals. The reinforced concrete warehouse in which the feed was stored reached the height of a five-story building. I had to watch the rats, mice and guinea pigs and learn how to handle them. By observing the work of laboratory technician Segawa, I gradually learned how to inoculate animals, draw blood, kill and dissect them. Two years ago, I had to deal with mice, so I knew a little bit about how to pick them up with my hands. While I considered mice to be very entertaining critters, I still realized that there was no point in being particularly concerned about their fate, but I was annoyed by the rough treatment of the animals. When you let a mouse out on the metal mesh of the cage and grab it by the tail, it starts scrambling its legs in a vain attempt to escape. When you take it by the ears or scruff of the neck, it clings so tenaciously to the net with its pink paws that it has to be pulled away by force. A feeling of pity prevented me from treating these tiny animals too cavalierly, but I did not wish to be laughed at for my sentimentality and endeavoured to perform all the operations with the same indifference as the others. Soon I saw Hayashida unexpectedly. We were very excited to learn that we would be working together. Why didn't you show up for a long time? You were hired too, weren't you? I asked him right away. Okay, wait. I don't know anything yet, neither how to feed the mice nor how to handle them. Let me look around. We'll talk later, he said. And then he stopped talking as Sagawa came up to us. Wearing tight rubber gloves, we did the work we had set out to do the day before. For Hayashida, it was completely unfamiliar. In the afternoon, Sagawa needed to go somewhere. As he left, he left Hayashida, who was moving slowly. You catch up with the others faster. When we were alone, 
As is usually the case with people who have not seen each other for a long time, I did not know where to begin our conversation. I have a new one every day. Yesterday it was horses, today it's rats. If we stay together for a long time now, then, as they say, we will have joys even in sorrow, Hayashida said, picking up a mouse by the tail. He did this exercise several times, making hilarious grimaces. The team leader really hates me. That Kamiya guy, whenever he sees me, he's bound to say something humiliating. It's just unfortunate, he continued. When we were still studying, Kamiya used to come to his group at night and start asking questions about the material covered during the day. He would ask tricky questions, tormenting the whole group. Apparently, he wanted his group to have the best results in their study. It was hard to say for what reason, but Hayashida got the worst of it. Uh, when you think about it, he said sadly, holding back his anger. Yesterday I went to the section where the horses are kept. I was asked a long time there, but I don't know anything, so I, a fool of fools like you, was sent here to the rats. As of today I'm staying here. I think it'll be better here, except that your superiors. It was clear that Hayashida was afraid, thinking that he would be given an exam here too. I really wanted to invite him to my room, but it was apparently not allowed and I didn't have the courage to ask my superior. Only two of Hayashida's group got into the departments because their exam results weren't brilliant. Kamiya seemed to be in a bad mood because of that, and there was no way he wanted to let anyone from his group who ended up assigned to a department out of his sight. So apparently he did not give up on this, even when we moved to another room. Back in my barracks, where we couldn't talk about work, I began to think about how I could help Hayashida. The next day I advised him to go to Sagawa, the laboratory technician, we dreadfully disliked pretending to be deaf, and nevertheless we had to resort to it, even though we felt bad about it afterward, but it was not perfidy on our part, there was simply no other way. When a boss asks you about your work, I suppose you don't have to answer him, do you? Hayashida began turning to Sagawa. I listened with my back turned to him. The boss asks, what's your supervisor's name? Sagawa asked sharply. I realized that these words did not apply only to him. Let's know this, Sagawa continued. There is no chief of training or team leader for you here. Even we have no right to talk about our work in the family. Understood? If anyone else asks stupid questions like that, tell me, he finished. We breathed a sigh of relief then. However, in the end, this conversation turned out very badly. Since then, team leader Kamiya has been hitting Hayashida on every occasion. Soon I was transferred to work in the central squad building behind the brick wall. I had to part ways with Hayashida again. Apparently all this time Sagawa had been eyeing us to keep whoever he liked best, so I ended up in the Takagi section where he worked. There my new friends were Hosaka and Sasa, who came from another section. Here, behind a brick wall, all the hard work was done by the Manchus and no one working in other sections was allowed to enter. In Major Takagi's section, there were two engineers, seven laboratory technicians, twenty freelancers, and one lieutenant medical officer and one trainee officer. When we three newcomers were enrolled in this section, it became about 40 men. The section had eight laboratories and a number of other rooms, including a storage room for cultivated deadly bacteria, rooms for preparing nutrient medium and growing bacteria, a meeting room, a check room, a shower room, etc. The entrance to the section was closed by a dark curtain. The entrance to the section was covered by a dark red drape. The windows, if they could be called windows, were covered with dense metal nets to protect them from flies. Major Takagai didn't seem particularly anxious to get us involved. What can they do, tomboys? he said with a wry smile. He did, however, provide one room and everything we needed for the class. In this room someone must have studied before us, for books on bacteriology were left on the shelves. From military doctor Sujitsuka, we received white protective coats khaki-colored work uniforms, rubber boots and gloves, masks and caps. The section number and personal number were written on each item in white paint. The items you have now received are your primary weapons, especially the protective smocks. They can only be worn in the lab. If you have to go outside, you must wear your work uniform, the doctor explained to Sujitsuka, looking at us slyly. He ordered Sagawa, the lab technician standing next to him, to make room in the closet for our clothes. It was immediately apparent to us that the doctor was trying to hold himself with dignity. Sagawa, he told him, Major Takagi is concerned that you don't know how to do anything. 
you must learn without wasting a minute to prepare for real work as soon as possible. So we began to learn from comrades who had started working in the section before us, and to study books intensely. One Saturday in early May, me, Sasa, and Hosaka were sitting in our assigned room reading books on bacteriology as usual. It was about five o'clock in the evening, and we were about to leave when Sagawa entered the room and said, Major Takagi is now apparently in the conference room in the main building, or maybe he has already left altogether. Should one of you go there and see if he's there? May I? I volunteered, and left the room. The entrance to the main building was at the end of a wide corridor. The plague section laboratories were on the right and the cholera section on the left. It was impossible to get into these laboratories without special permission. As I approached the entrance to the building, I asked the sentry where Major Takagi was. The sentry replied that the Major had already left. On my way back, I happened to glance out the window overlooking the courtyard and saw a strange green-coloured closed car with no windows. It was surrounded by plainclothes guards. It was clear that they were gendarmes in disguise. Curious, I stopped and watched. Of course, I did not expect to see anything interesting or entertaining. It was just that, not yet knowing what the task of our detachment was, I naturally paid attention to anything that was unfamiliar to my eyes. Remembering that standing in the corridor is not allowed, I turned around and went back to the main building. Near the car, I saw a dozen or two men handcuffed and blindfolded. I immediately determined that they were not Japanese. Most of them looked like Chinese, five or six of them had blonde hair. They were pushed out of the car through the back door. Two or three men who could not stand on their feet were picked up by the gendarmes under the arms and lowered to the ground. When everyone was led into the main building through a door we never used, I hurried back to my room. After reporting to Sagawa about Major Takagi, I said quietly to Seisa and Hosaka, You know what I just saw? They brought in prisoners, not Japanese. They were guarded even more tightly than we were, all blindfolded and handcuffed. They must have been brought in to work, said Hosaka. No, that can't be, Sasa said with a serious look. No one is allowed to enter the main building, much less foreigners. Where will they be kept in detention? They must be foreign spies. Sasa had once heard some talk about sending captured spies to the squad. They are spies, he said affirmatively. It seemed plausible to me too at first, but the more I thought about them, the more I doubted it. So why are they being brought to our unit? Where are they being held? I thought. The brig is next to the training building, and if they are kept there, there is no reason to take them to the main building through two guarded gates. Besides, I had never heard of foreigners being kept in the brig. Back at the barracks that day, I kept looking out the windows thinking to see the handcuffed men again. But in the evening I saw no sign of them in the main building. Is there probably a prison in the main building? I asked Sass, remembering that a man who works in the main building lives in the same room with him, and may have heard about it. I don't know, but I don't think there is any prison there, Sasa replied. The next day from noon we were free. We had no rest on Sundays in our squad. I followed Hayashida and we went into the field that started just outside the towns. As we basked in the sun we talked about the prisoners. There seems to be a prison in the main building. They say they keep enemy spies there, I began. Oh yes, why do they bring them to the squad? And our squad is a bit strange. I don't feel like I'm in the military, Hayashida said. His dreams of real military service, inspired by his older brother's stories, had been deceived. Every day he fiddled with mice and was bullied by Komiya, who was unkind to him from the start. Subsequently, I kept paying attention to the passing automobiles, but did not notice anything of the kind. But then one Saturday night, Sasa ran up to me and quietly said, I saw it too. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon today. Soon we noticed that people started paying attention to us. Every Saturday at three o'clock in the afternoon, the dark curtains on the windows in our room were lowered. We were sure that this was the time when new prisoners were brought in. Everyone realized this. Even in the group engaged in agricultural work, secret conversations about the prisoners began. For a long time it was only talked about in a narrow circle of friends. Where were the mysterious prisoners actually being held? No one knew, and everyone made all sorts of guesses. Just when I was a little mastered with the work in my section, as I was entrusted with a new dangerous duty. As you know, the plague, the most terrible of contagious diseases, so even experienced people must observe extreme caution when handling plague material, and I was just assigned to transfer plague-infected rats into special cages and collect fleas from them. 
In addition, I had to infect healthy rats with plague, and then dissect them to obtain the material needed to grow plague bacteria. It was explained to us that the causative agent of plague lives in the bodies of mice, rats, gophers, and other wild rodents, and that in Manchuria plague affects people every year in a number of areas. If a person is bitten by a flea that has drunk the blood of a plague-infected rat, he becomes infected with the so-called bubonic form of plague. The saliva of plague patients, which is splashed by spitting and coughing, contains plague bacilli. When they enter the lungs of another person by inhalation, he or she becomes ill with the pneumonic form of plague. If the bacilli get on the skin, the bubonic form of plague occurs. If they get into the eyes, a person falls ill with the ocular form of plague. Plague patients almost never recover. To us, with very scanty medical knowledge, all this was explained only in general terms. We learned that in the pneumonic form of plague, pneumonia develops rapidly. We also learned that in cholera, the temperature jumps to 45 degrees, dehydration occurs, the person dries up like a mummy and dies. When we imagined what danger threatened us, our hair literally stood on end with fear. The plague causes inflammation and swelling in the tissues surrounding the lymph nodes. Subcutaneous hemorrhages cause the skin on the face and chest to turn blue. These accounts of the plague evoked the fearful faces of leapers or ghosts from the famous stories of the writer Yetsuya. Now we were literally afraid to open our mouths and held our breath to avoid infection. Before starting work, we were treated with carbolic acid solution. After work we did the same. And whenever we left the lab to eat or talk to someone, we would shower and be treated with disinfectant solutions. We dealt with a wide variety of species of field mice and rats that were caught all over Manchuria. To prevent fleas from jumping from one host to another and biting them, the animals were placed in deep glass jars that were covered with double wire mesh lids. The jars were placed in crates also wrapped with metal mesh. Before entering the preparation room, we put on protective coveralls, rubber gloves and boots over underwear made of dense white fabric, and covered our faces with masks. Rodents in the jars were killed with chloroform, then extracted and pomed out their fleas, which were further examined under a microscope. We dissected many mice and rats, carriers of plague to take from them lumps of clotted blood. We identified such animals by swollen lymph nodes. In the absence of these signs, we cut open the abdomen and extracted the spleen. Unlike other rodents, mice have one characteristic feature, the fact that they have plague bacilli in large numbers accumulate in the heart. By taking blood from the heart as a material for seeding, a pure culture of bacteria can be prepared. Although this work was called research work, it was actually done for the sole purpose of obtaining pathogenic bacteria. It was for this purpose that rats and mice were infected. Of course, this work was simpler than identifying the causative bacteria. In order to obtain plague bacilli in pure culture, a nutrient medium was used, on which these bacteria grow especially fast. We could not conduct the work of separating different types of bacteria ourselves, and we were not entrusted with this work. We were engaged only in preparation of pure culture of plague bacilli. This work required extreme caution, because in case of infection one could not count on recovery. Such cases always end in death. In this work we could not be afraid of fleas and flies, which are carriers of infection, so we performed it more calmly. It was no longer necessary to take great care in dressing, as was necessary when we were dealing with mice and rats. See, apart from white coats, we only wore headgear, rubber gloves and masks. Some of us worked in the same coveralls and masks, and even without gloves. We have to be on guard at all times. A freelance laboratory technician named Koida warned us carefully. At first our work seems very difficult, but once you get used to it you can learn to do everything quickly and without error. When he introduced himself to us, he said that he came here from Nagano Prefecture and that he had been with the unit for about two and a half years. Among the many employees who were gloomy and withdrawn, this man with an open face and clear eyes stood out like a bright flower among the moss. When growing bacteria, chicken embryos and peptone were sometimes used as a nutrient medium, but more often agar-agar was used for this purpose. To live bacteria were transferred to fresh media using a special platinum loop. In the laboratory where the bacteria were grown, along the walls stretched shelves with countless tubes with media, which were stored in an inclined position. I could not immediately get used to this work and was nervous, repeating the same technique several times. To avoid introducing foreign bacteria into the medium, 
By each time Cal kind the platinum loop and the open end of the tube, then carefully, so as not to touch the loop itself frozen mass of fresh nutrient medium, applied a portion of nutrient medium with live bacteria on a piece of agar agar. After that, the loop, on which remained a little bit of old nutrient medium, it was necessary to quickly, without letting the bacteria escape into the air, for a second reintroduced into the flame of the burner. Having finished sowing the bacteria, I again burned the open end of the tube over the flame of the burner, then plugged the tube with absorbent cotton, labelled it with the type of bacteria and the date of sowing and put it on the shelf. After a day and a half or two days, the tubes were packed into crates and taken by handcarts to the storage room in the main building. I started my new job not without trepidation. For the first time in my life I had to cross the threshold of the laboratory, but mechanically repeating the same thing from day to day, I gradually got used to the work, realised its danger and finally lost heart. At times I even envied my peers who worked in the fields under the bright rays of the sun. In my soul I gradually grew anxiety, because I did not understand the meaning of the work on the reproduction of bacteria. If all this serves the cause of medicine, designed to protect human life, it must somehow contribute to the measures to combat disease. But here, on the contrary, they multiply the most dangerous bacteria. I told about the first stage of work, when the bacteria were grown in test tubes. But soon, in addition to test tubes, for this purpose began to use special large vessels with a diameter of one and a half to two meters, which were called cultivators issue system. These cultivators made it possible to grow microbes in enormous quantities. I was told that by the time I arrived at the laboratory, about 25 kilograms of deadly bacteria from plague, cholera, typhus, gas, gangrene, and other diseases had already been produced. Each gram of these bacteria could kill millions of people. The amount of bacteria accumulated was calculated in astronomical numbers. The smallest of the tubes we used were about three centimeters in diameter, and most of the tubes were larger, even assuming that each test tube contained at least 50 milligrams of bacteria. This meant that there were about 5 million bacteria in each tube. In order to keep the activity of the plague bacilli going, it was necessary to inject them into a living organism at least once a month. Therefore, storing the bacteria alone was a terribly burdensome endeavor. I heard that it took more than a thousand people just to cultivate and store the bacteria. In short, more effort and money was spent on cultivating biological agents than on fighting epidemics, and this diabolical production was constantly expanding. Often we had to stay in the laboratory late into the night. In the second part of the book I will tell about what I heard about the production of bacteriological bombs. The more often we had to work late into the night, the more gloomy people's faces became. The work in the laboratories became boring and to this was added an unaccountable homesickness. Due to constant overwork and sleep deprivation, my head was always heavy and my eyes became wandering. This condition was very dangerous for our profession. Working with bacteria you can not be distracted for a moment. Gaping you can drop a test tube. A if you sow the culture of bacteria hand trembles, it can happen irreparable misfortune. Suppose bacteria get on your finger. A person forgets to sanitize his hand and the bacteria with food gets into the mouth. As a result, infection and death are inevitable. After all, bacteria cannot be seen with the naked eye. Consequently, nerves are constantly tense. When even the slightest suspicion arises, it is necessary to wash and be treated with a disinfectant solution. All of this eventually frayed my nerves so much that it became unbearable to do the damned work. Smell of carbolic already irritated me. When fatigue from lack of sleep and nervous tension reached the limit, I became afraid and had a desire to die. Sometimes our elders were late, then we stopped working and dreamed of returning home. But there were other times, when we had finished our work and were about to leave, the Dr. Sujitsuka appeared and made us wash test tubes and other utensils. We had to go back to work. No matter how much we resented it, the order was still an order. We had to get our hands dirty again and resentment grew in our hearts. Our discontent did not escape Tujitsuka's attention, and the more it hurt his ego, the more work we had to do. Now I was finally convinced that I was unlucky. I berated myself for having thought of going to Manchuria, but it was too late to regret it. At night I couldn't sleep tossing and turning in my bunk. My body, exhausted during the day, could not find rest, and different thoughts were going through my head. Again and again images of my native land came before my eyes. I had vowed to myself more than once not to think about it. Morijima and Kuzuno, 
who lived in the same room with me, longed as much as I did. At first I even laughed at Kusuno, who cried every now and then calling him a wimp and a crybaby, but now I understood his state of mind. Covering my head with a blanket, I let my tears flow. I felt better and fell asleep. Only Hamanaka from the general department seems to be cheerful. Apparently he didn't feel as much distress at work as we did. He had met a girl, the daughter of a doctor who served in the unit. In addition, apparently in the general department the situation was not as oppressive as in ours. As time went on, I became very gaunt. My eyes sunken in, red and cowardly, like a hare. Wouldn't it be better to die at once, or maybe run away? Was the joke we sometimes made when it was just the three of us, me, Sasa, and Hasaka. Perhaps my friends were thinking about it seriously, but committing suicide wasn't something we had the guts to do, and running away was impossible. So in the end we get as the only person who consoled us was Koida, the freelancer. Sometimes when he saw that we were sad, he wanted enough moping boys. Cheer up. Let's go for a walk in the field. And he'd take us to the meadow to the airfield. There we wrestled with each other or had fun catching gophers. A gopher digs a hole with two exits, and if you try to catch it at one exit, it will slip through the other. We tried to find both exits. If we succeeded, someone guarded at one exit and water was poured into the other. Fleeing from the water, the gopher would pop out of its hole and into our hands. Koda read poetry and taught us war songs. From him we learned the march of the Kwantung Army and the song of the Water Supply and Prevention Department of the Kwantung Ai. Look, soon the clouds will part. Our Imperial Army will make life easy. Life is still hard for the people. But despite the cheerful words of this song, the setting sun seemed sad to us. And as we sang, turning to the sky red from the sunset, we began to feel even more homesick. In our free time we wrote letters home, but for some reason we rarely received an answer. We wrote to our parents, brothers, school friends, but in most cases we never knew whether they received our letters or not. On June 8, 1945, the day of the reading of the Imperial Decrees, we were built on the roof of the main building. The ceremony began at 8 o'clock in the morning simultaneously in all units of the detachment. After the ceremony of bowing to the Imperial Palace and reading the Imperial Decrees, we were addressed by Lieutenant General Kikuchi, the head of the First Division, Lieutenant General of the Medical Service, a man in his late teens, with hair as white as snow and a deafening voice. He was a pioneer in a unit that the whole world now feared, and his every word seemed to resonate in our heart. We first went up to the roof of this tall building, from which all around us we could see far and wide. The long and boring ceremony held no interest for us, except that we were fortunate enough to see Lieutenant General Kikuchi so closely. However, the opportunity to look around the surroundings of our town was very useful to us, so I almost kept my eyes on the view before me. A vast plain stretched as far as the horizon line shrouded in a light haze. It was as plain as the palm of my hand and I, who had been shut up in the four walls of the laboratory, contemplated it with such a refreshing feeling that I felt as if I had escaped. A faint morning breeze was blowing, and a fish scale was shining in the not yet hot morning sun. Trying not to waste a second of the short break announced after the ceremony, I looked greedily at the boundless Manchurian steppe. At times my eyes found on its boundless expanse tiny, as if toy buildings of Ping Fan Station, which was almost eight kilometers away from us, then the red roof of the Lamis Temple, then a distant melting in a purple haze monument to the fallen Japanese soldiers in Harbin. I didn't notice Caesar coming toward me, with a mysterious look, as if about to tell me something very important, he said, Let's go there quickly. Let's have a look. I followed him. We came to the edge of the roof on the inside of the building, and I froze in place. Up to now, having seen the main building only from the outside, I was sure that it was an ordinary quadrangular building. But now I saw that it was built in the form of a closed quadrangle. Inside it was a narrow courtyard, like a deep gorge with steep cliffs at the bottom of which lurked a small squat structure. There were small windows in some places in the walls, barely letting in any light. The sun's rays never fell on this gloomy block of stone. It was undoubtedly a prison. Neither Sasa nor I could utter a word for a long time. We felt as if we had seen something forbidden. Our eyes expressed surprise and curiosity, our cheeks burning. So this is where we've gotten pretending as if we didn't notice anything. Sasa and I moved slowly along the edge of the roof and looked down. 
we noticed that the prison was connected to the main building on both sides by covered passages. It seemed as if it was attached to the main building on both sides with its outgrowths. Oh, look, there's someone there. I lowered my voice and shoved Sass with my elbow. One of the strange men I had seen the day before, as they were being led out of the locked car, was strolling through the courtyard. The prisoner moved slowly, barely dragging the massive iron chains he was shackled in. He had the look of a man who had detached himself from everything. We understood. There was a reason why the entrance to the central corridor was so carefully locked, and the windows facing the courtyard of the main building were shuttered. So oh, that's who should be more to be pitied than us, B.I. said. Yes, to see only one small square of sky every day, Sasser sympathized. Our other workmates, calling out to each other, were also watching this unfortunate man. Soon the signal was sounded, announcing the beginning of classes, and we went downstairs. It was obvious that no one wanted to leave. Neither we, the newcomers, who had climbed to the roof of the main building for the first time, nor those who had started working here earlier, but rarely got this opportunity. As I reached the middle of the stairs, I saw Hosaka ahead of me. With him was his buddy, a fellow countryman. I caught up with them. Did you see that? Both nodded their heads in the affirmative. Their faces showed that they too were stunned by what they had seen in the courtyard. That day we, the newcomers, were excited and overwhelmed by the unexpected discovery and made all kinds of guesses and assumptions. Could it be that we had been deliberately led out onto the roof? Could it be that instead of increasing our suspicions by unnecessary secrecy, we, doomed to remain here until death, were being secretly revealed? The elders, however, maintained their usual, unperped look. They didn't seem to be interested in our thoughts. But why would there be a prison in a medical unit? There must be some very important reason for that. The reason that made them keep secret not only the creation of bacteriological bombs, but also to hide the fact that there was a prison in the squad. Listen, what does your section do? What? Don't you know not to talk about such things? I don't care. It's between us, so there's nothing to be afraid of. We had such conversations in the barracks after lights out. Morishima from Iwate Prefecture was the most silent. He rarely spoke first. It is truly agonizing to keep secrets from each other when you live in the same room and work under the same roof. It was only in frank conversation with comrades that one could vent in the oppressive environment of a dreary life in a squad where there was no entertainment. We had lived together for a month, but we had not yet truly bonded. The heavy burden of secrecy made each of us keep to ourselves, but in the end we couldn't stand it. In friendly conversations among ourselves, we began to find out the purpose of the unit, about which we had not yet been told anything, and gradually we began to think more and more seriously about our unenviable fate. The first unit consisted of three numbered departments. The first, second, and third, in addition, there were two more detachments. Gen in the first department studied the use of bacteria causative agents of such contagious diseases as plague, cholera, typhoid, diphtheria, tuberculosis, gas gangrene, sap and others, and measures of protection against them. Second department worked on the problems of making bacteriological bombs and filters, and studied the effectiveness of bacteriological warfare agents under various meteorological conditions. An aviation group of seven transport planes was assigned to this department. The third division, or Asahina section, studied various types of bacteria intended to infect agricultural crops such as cereals, legumes, and Kusuno and Morishima served in the meteorology section, but in addition to making meteorological observations, they often had to go on errands to different parts of the squadron. Harmonica of the general section said that there were branches of the unit in Hala, Nunjang, Haihi, and Mudanjang, and a test site in Enida. There were rumors that in the mountains of North Korea, the second division had an entire underground factory where research work on death rays and the atomic bomb was being conducted back home. I'd heard her talk that Japan was preparing some special weapons, and now I believed all these rumors more and more. To think, they say that our squadron spends 10 million yen a year. That kind of money wouldn't just be spent on one squad. I guess that's what the weapons are used for, Harmonica once said, clearly proud of even the scant information he had obtained. Although we were only called a detachment, we had three lieutenant generals of medical service, five or six major generals, about 16 colonels, more than 20 lieutenant colonels and majors, and nearly 300 junior officers and officer candidates. A great many served here on a freelance basis. 
It was said that doctors of medicine, working in the field of bacteriology, were gathered from almost all over Japan, and there were more than 10 people equal to generals and more than 30 to colonels among them. In all, there were over 2,000 men in the unit. I have heard that Detachment 731 was the only way for military doctors to get a career. If they didn't serve here, they had no hope of promotion. But at that time I did not know that the bacteria I was cultivating would be used to make bombs, nor did I know how powerful they were. It was a considerable time before I learned about it in detail. It was the middle of June. One evening the laboratory technician Sagawa came in with a paper in his hand and announced, The squad order has been received. Listen, I'll read it out. And he began to read it. It's the meaning of the order was that the members of the squad must increase their vigilance to prevent spies from getting wind of the squad and be even more zealous in their duties. I will briefly tell you why this order was issued, Sagawa said after he finished reading. He explained that the Soviets had captured intact German bacteriological laboratories with which our unit had been exchanging materials, and as a result the research being conducted here had become known, and now the Soviets are pushing more and more vigorously for an investigation. Research in the field of bacteriological warfare is being conducted not only by Germany, Sagawa added, but also by America and the Soviet Union. But only we have managed to create a bacteriological bomb suitable for practical use. Therefore, you members of the squad, which holds the key to the final victory, must understand the seriousness of the situation, imbued with a sense of pride for his fatherland and keep military secrets. By the way, today I'll tell you the story of our squad. We three newcomers and two employees who had joined the unit only six months earlier than us sat around Sagawa and prepared to listen. This is what we learned from his story. Before the events at Kolkingol in 1939, there was a Department of Water Supply and Prevention of the Kwantung Army Units, which was headed by the current head of the 1st Division, Lieutenant General Kikuchi. At first, the main task of this office was to provide drinking water for the Army to check the suitability of foodstuffs and to control local epidemic diseases that afflicted soldiers. The forms of diseases which occurred for unknown reasons varied from area to area. In addition, at times no sooner had the experts studied the causative agent than the disease stopped on its own. For convenience, the diseases were given the name of the corresponding air, high he fever, sanyu fever, etc. During the events at Kalk and Go, it was noticed that it was possible not only to prevent diseases, but also to use them effectively for offensive purposes. Under the pressure of the Red Army's motorized infantry units, the Japanese troops were forced to retreat, but at the same time they strived to keep the water bodies, sources of water supply, at all costs. Who controls the water bodies? He maintains a dominant position on the battlefield. It was also the responsibility of the Army's water supply directorate to take care of the reservoirs, on one occasion, the directorate was ordered to contaminate the water in the upper reaches of the Kolkingo River, the water source for the entire surrounding area, with typhus, cholera, and plague bacteria in order to force the enemy to retreat. It was a deadly mission. In carrying it out, more than 30 army and freelance doctors died. Some of them may have become infected themselves when they released the deadly bacteria into the water, but most of them were killed by enemy fire while carrying out this operation. Usually so many military doctors don't die all at once. Isn't that right? After all, when our army advances, the medical units usually follow behind the troops, Saigawa emphasized meaningfully. Listening to him with bated breath, we learned that in the Kolkingo River basin from Nomonkan to Lake Bayanua an epidemic broke out at once, and the Japanese army was in a very favorable position. Typhus is a cold belt disease. It is an indispensable companion of war and has a significant impact on the outcome of hostilities. The history of wars tells us this. The spread of typhus is facilitated by fleas and lice parasitizing humans, inevitable at the front, where dirt always reigns. So it should not have surprised anyone that an epidemic broke out in the Kolkingol area. This is the lure of bacteriological warfare, Saigawa emphasized, as if summarizing the first part of his story. After a pause, he continued. After the events at Kaukin Go, where the Kuntung army had to fight the heaviest battles in its history, the army command began to attach very serious importance to bacteriological warfare. The water supply and prophylaxis department received a commendation from the army commander for successfully holding water reservoirs for the first time in the history of sanitary units. 
However, the circumstances of the deaths of military doctors were not reported in detail. It was only announced that several men had died. In time, the head of this department became the current head of Ishai Detachment, and in 1942 it was transformed into Detachment 731. Since the intelligence agencies of many countries were always hunting for this detachment, in 1945 it was given a new name, Manchurian Detachment 25. Sagawa then moved on to the story of Ishii. His Excellency the Squad Leader is the pride of Japan. Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Engineering, Doctor of Science, three doctorates at once. He invented the water filters and bacteria cultivators that you use every day. And all those, Sagawa pointed toward the second division, water supply vehicles. These vehicles are now the necessary, essential weapons of the Kwantung Army. We had heard about Ishii's filters and his drinking water trucks before. During our studies, we went to the factory where these filters were made. The factory was not far from the army hospital in Harbin. I remember the building with a red tiled roof and a long furnace where diatomite, the raw material for filter plates, was roasted. The factory was set up for inline production of various filters for individual use, as well as company and battalion filters. When all was said about Ishirai, Sagawa moved on to filters and automobiles. Filters for individual use are similar to small wearable decontamination machines. Such a filter can be kept on your back during use. It is enough to push the lever of the hand pump and drinking water flows immediately from the rubber hose. The mouth filter is about two meters long and has a small hand wheel. If the hand wheel is turned, the filter will suck up contaminated water with one hose and supply clean water from the other. It was said that with the help of this excellent apparatus any polluted water, except seawater, could be purified and that it did not catch only one certain virus, and even then harmless to man. Smetlar supply machines are equipped with larger filters. Wood is used in the construction of such a machine wherever possible, so that it can be quickly burned when threatened with capture by an enemy. But in areas where there is a constant shortage of drinking water, these vehicles are truly invaluable. Sagawa finished his story. We listened to Sagawa's story about General Ishii with awe, as if it were a tale of a great man. In our eyes Ishii was almost a deity. We had not yet had the chance to see the chief of the detachment up close. Only once did Lama manage to catch a glimpse of him as he drove by in a magnificent dark green car, accompanied by top officers. That evening the discussion of Sagawa's story continued late into the night. One freeman had disappeared from our unit. It was the day I received my discharge from the barracks for the second time after joining the unit. It had been only two months since my arrival here. But because of the monotonous and strict routine, with only half a day's rest a week, it seemed to me an agonizingly long time. At eight o'clock in the morning, the thirty men who had received their furloughs that day assembled in front of the barracks of the training department to behave as ordered. Remember that outside the gates of the unit, foreign spies will be after you. Don't talk. Even if a Japanese soldier or gendarme speaks to you, don't go anywhere with them. Understood? You, junior military official of Yuji, from the training department admonished us. He looked us over, gave us a casual salute, and stepped down from the dais, where he had stood during the briefing. Since walking alone was not allowed, we were divided into groups of five bound together by a chain of command. Three freelancers were appointed as leaders. Of these I knew only Nakano, and the other two, Kitajima and Sakin, were un- Hayashida had also been given leave, but the five in which he was placed were far away from us, and I was unable to call on him. The object of our walk was to get acquainted with Harbin. When a Fuji had gone and we were getting ready to depart, oh me, a freeman suddenly appeared and shouted loudly, attention, and began to saunter in front of the formation. We had no sympathy for this man. At the same time, we, the laboratory workers, where he himself had no right to enter, were like an eyesore. Now I will check how you know the rules of behavior during dismissal, he finally spoke. What will you do if you suddenly fall behind your five? Number four of the second five, answer me. It was Okainaka. I, number three of the five, trembled with fear. Yes, sir. I'll go to the squad communication center and ask to be sent here, Okinaka replied worriedly. It was this guy who had been the first of us to get beaten up by Omi, and now he really didn't want to have another trouble through him. The communication point doesn't provide services to children who get lost. Who's going to answer differently? May I? I will stay where I am and wait until my comrades find me. 
answered someone from the third five. Okay, how much trouble with you? Well, who else? All stood silent, not moving, and on their faces it was obvious that the anticipated pleasure of the walk has already been spoiled. I can see that you have not yet internalized the spirit of our squad. To think that such a thing could happen is to make a mistake. How is it that none of you did not realize to answer that he would never leave his fellow five? Those who were distinguished by such deep thinking were often found among the chiefs at that time. I remember how in the first days of drill one day the instructor came to me and, having made me repeat the shoulder technique many times, suddenly silently reached out his hand, grabbed my rifle and pulled it to himself. I decided that I should probably give him the weapon, so I let it out of his hands, and he suddenly lashed out at me. Mm, who are you if you give up your rifle? The soul of a soldier, so easily. In short, they were setting traps for us every now and then. Although the instructor had the rank of lieutenant, I lost all respect for him. Such people imagine that since they are the bosses and we have to obey without question, then they can mock us. From then on, we all despised Omi. Two plain-clothes gendarmes travelled with us in a military truck. At Pingfei Station we transferred to a motor train and drove to Harbin. From Pingfei we saw for the first time the whole town of our detachment, the main building of which looked like a white castle from up to the horizon line the terrain was very flat, and the landscape was extremely monotonous. In Harbin we first of all went to the communications office in Girinskaya Street, where we parted with the gendarmes. At the Russian cemetery we boarded a streetcar and drove past the Higashi Honganji Temple and Akibayashi department store to the Songari River. No one bought tickets. The conductor, a tall Russian immigrant, watched unhappily as one by one we got off the carriage. The last one to get off was very frightened when the conductor pushed him in the back, and the rest of us had some unpleasant residue from this free ride. By the river we sat down on the stunted grass. On the other side we could see beautiful bright yellow buildings, and upstream the red arcs of the trusses of the railroad bridge. From the cosy riverside clubhouse came cheerful music that sounded like light ripples running across the majestically calm surface of the river. Nakano hung a towel on a tree and said, You may walk within sight of this sign. A no longer young, lone freelancer named Kitajima, who had come along with us, jokingly stating, Well, Mr. Nakano, in that case I will allow myself to leave you. Smirking, he took an exaggeratedly polite visor. You'll probably be busy now. Hello to your spouse. Nakano laughed. Don't come back empty-handed, Sakin said cheerfully. Those who knew that Kitajima was a bachelor knew what he was talking about and smirked. I'd run into Kitajima in the bachelor's dining room, and I was beginning to guess what was going on. Why are you laughing? It's none of your childish business, Sakin reprimanded me, though his face was not stern. A Chinese street photographer approached us, and we surrounded him. The five that Hayashida was in also joined us. Well, gentlemen soldiers, would you like some? The photographer spoke to us in good Japanese. Flattered to be called Mr. Soldiers, we became animated. One of us We would like to be photographed, but only we can't tell you where to send the photo cards. You don't have to. I'm taking snapshots. In fifteen minutes they will be ready. With these words the photographer aimed his big camera at us and wanted to take pictures. We started to pose, but then Sakin shouted. Hey, come on, you can't take pictures like that. The photographer walked away, smiling sourly. I don't feel like going back to the squadron, Hayashida suddenly said, staring at the blue sky in silence. Look, they will hear, I said warningly, but his groupmates supported Hayashida. With a team leader like that, you really don't want to, one of them said unhappily. When you're in the group, you're being hunted by your superior, and when you go on leave, you're being hunted by spies. Didn't this photographer seem suspicious to you? Concluded the other one. All right, enough. Don't spoil your mood. I tried to calm them down. But the conversation continued. Hayashida was eager to pour out what he had against Kamiya. That Kamiya likes to get his hands dirty. He uses his fists, Hayashida continued, and then added with a bitter grin that only I could understand. After that time, it's been harder and harder for me. The thing is, I once encouraged him to use Sagawa's lab technician name to avoid trouble. Maybe because of that, he's in an even worse situation. At the thought of it, I felt acutely guilty toward Hayashida. 
perhaps about three o'clock in the afternoon we returned to the Harbin station to the point of communication with the detachment, but here we had to wait a long time. Four o'clock struck, and we still hadn't been dispatched. Ni, Kitajima had not returned. Hamanaka told us when he found out what was the matter. By five o'clock, the entire communications centre was in an uproar. Angry-faced supervisors were scurrying back and forth, whispering to each other, making phone calls. Eventually, we returned to the unit without Kitajima. He had disappeared and was never seen again. Hamanaka, who served in the general department, later told us that according to some rumours Kitajima was captured by foreign intelligence, and according to others, he himself turned out to be a spy. It was a day of rest. We did the laundry. Everyone had to do it for themselves. But since we washed twice a day and each time we had to disinfect and bleach our clothes, we were not too burdened with laundry. The so greatest pleasure for us on a free day was to get a good night's sleep, because day after day we had to follow a strict schedule. We had to get up at five o'clock, work all day, and sit in lectures until ten o'clock in the evening. We on this free day I was going to go to bed at two o'clock as usual, after it laundry, but this time I didn't succeed. Is Aikiyama-kun here? someone asked, addressing Morishima. I was in the room at the time, and when I heard the question from the corridor, I became wary. Although the voice of the questioner had a soft tone, I was afraid that he was a gendarme. True, I felt no guilt, but for some reason I felt a chill inside, with difficulty restraining my excitement. I went out into the corridor and saw a man in civilian clothes, unfamiliar to me. From his voice and movements this man seemed to be young, about thirty years old, but from his face I could give him forty. Where do you live in the village of Fes? He asked me smiling kindly and looked at me furtively from head to foot. When I answered that I lived by the river, he told me that he himself was from a neighbouring village, and his full face broke into a broad fatherly smile. I, too, smiled involuntarily and felt relieved. Thank God my fears had been in vain. It was the first time since my arrival in Manchuria that I had such an unexpected meeting. I was immediately flooded with fond memories of my native home, although this man was from a neighbouring village. Our houses were just where the villages bordered each other, and we happened to be close neighbours. My fellow countrymen knew our family a little, but I didn't remember him at all. Maybe because I was considerably younger than him, he knew well the famous temples in the vicinity of our village, and he remembered very well the tales we used to tell, such as the one about the princess who fell in love with a young samurai bewitched by a wicked witch, and saddened by the fact that he did not reciprocate her love, turned to stone. I listened to his stories and it made me feel calm and light at heart. Having given up hope of returning home, I had already resigned myself to my bleak existence, but the man's stories about his native land sounded like a sweet, soul-stirring melody that reminded me of the distant past and reawakened my longing for home. As we were talking, the head of the training department passed by us. He greeted my companion politely. I decided that the guest must be a famous person and being close to him filled my heart with pride. Shall we go for a walk? said my fellow countryman. And we went out into the street into a small garden where a single pine tree and a few Manchurian cherries grew. There are few forests in Manchuria and pine trees are very rare. The pine tree growing in this garden was probably one of only three such trees in the entire Binjiang province. Sitting down on a bench, we continued our conversation. You're good for coming here, even though you're young, you did the right thing. So how is it going for you here? Is it hard? Began fellow countrymen. No, nothing, everything is fine. I involuntarily lied. I somehow imperceptibly got into the habit of always giving such a stereotypical answer. But I felt trust in this man, so I added. Me. True, sometimes it can be boring. Because day after day you do the same thing. Fiddling with the plague bacteria that we grow. Stop it, he said and although he didn't raise his voice, I felt as if I had been splashed with cold water. You have to be vigilant, you know? What if I turned out to be an enemy spy? Just then I realized I hadn't asked his name yet. Well, you'll be more careful now. I can tell you from my own experience that spies are good at uncovering important secrets and making the most of seemingly nothing. My interlocutor said that Harbin now has almost three or four thousand spies from different countries trying to penetrate into the secrets of our unit. Japan is now superior to all countries in the preparation of bacteriological warfare, so their attention is focused on our unit, 
Around Harbin, a secret war is unfolding, which is known only in the narrow circle of the leaders of the Kwantung Army and the War Ministry, but neither the people nor the soldiers have the slightest idea about it. 731. That number is much better known abroad than in Japan itself. Rem From further conversation I learned that my guest's name was Akasha Yoshitaka. He was a cadre scout of the Kwantung Army, three times secretly sneaked into Chongqing, and Xiang Kai-shek even set a reward for his head, a hundred thousand dollars. Akashi was engaged in catching enemy spies who were trying to learn the secrets of our unit. According to him, those who could not be used as twinned spies were sent to the squad to be experimented on instead of being shot. I learned that the men who were brought to us every Saturday and put in prison were enemy spies, that already about 2,000 of them had died as a result of experiments on them, and that about 500 were now imprisoned in the inner prison. Human experiments, I blurted out. I looked at Akashi gasping with excitement, as if I had been grabbed firmly by the scruff of my neck. Akashi probably thought I already knew all of this, but I had only now heard these facts from him, and I did not doubt for a moment that he was telling the truth. Animal experiments occupy an important place in bacteriology. I remembered that in the books on bacteriology, which I looked through in the laboratory in three minutes, it, was, it should be remembered that with the same virulence of the pathogen in the animal course of the disease, is very often sharply different from the course of it in humans. It is natural that in experiments on man it is possible to obtain reliable results much more quickly than when working, for example with mice. Killing spies in deep secrecy was indeed an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone, if, of course, humanity considerations are put aside. I now realized with the utmost clarity what was the closely guarded secret of Unit 731, the exposure of which was so feared. What if I had turned out to be an enemy spy? Makashi's recent words I now wanted to repeat to him. When I will be able to meet again, I don't know. If I'm caught, I'll be killed just like those people. Akashi grinned sourly. What can you do? We are theirs and they are ours. After that conversation, I didn't see him for over a month. My superiors, having learned that I had met with Akashi, began to treat me much more gently. No, so you know Mr. Akashi? They asked. Yes, of course, because he's from a neighboring village, I replied, deliberately stressing the word neighboring village to emphasize our closeness. Is that so? This is a very big man. After all, he's the head of our squad's entire intelligence service, some said flatteringly, probably hoping that I would someday relay their words to Akashi. Whereas my comrades, especially Hamanaka and Hayashida, had been beaten by their superiors for the slightest trifle, I had no fear of being slapped so I felt even more respect for Akashi, and I began to worry about his fate. One day I dreamed that Akashi had been killed, but the dream was probably not so much due to my anxiety about him as to the fact that I myself might at any moment become infected and die unnoticed. 